Thank you for joining today's webinar. We'll be starting in just a few moments. Thank you for joining the National Conference of State Legislatures and the Pew Charitable Trust for this briefing on how states and the federal government support higher education through the tax code. My name is Dustin Whedon, and I'm a senior policy specialist in the education program at the National Conference of State Legislatures, and I will be serving as today's moderator. As a reminder, if at any time during the webinar you have difficulty hearing the audio through your computer speakers, please use your telephone to dial in to hear the audio portion. The National Conference of State Legislatures is pleased to partner with the Pew Charitable Trust to bring you this webinar. In case you are not familiar with NCSL, we are a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and staffs of the nation's 50 states and its commonwealths and territories. NCSL provides a number of services, including research, testimony, and opportunities for lawmakers to exchange ideas on pressing state policy issues. The subject of higher education tax policy falls within the jurisdiction of two NCSL committees the Budget and Revenue Committee, and the Education Committee. These standing committees provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, as well as a framework for legislators to create formal policy positions for NCSL. The committees meet twice a year at the NCSL Legislative Summit and the NCSL Capital Forum. For more information on these meetings or NCSL's activities and services to legislators and legislative staff, please visit our website at ncsl.org. Today's webinar highlights a recent report from the Pew Charitable Trust that provides information on characteristics and costs of the federal and state higher education personal income tax benefit. It will show how these tax benefits fit into the broader context of federal and state support for higher education and offer a state legislative perspective on using the tax code to offset higher education costs. We are very fortunate to have three distinguished speakers for today's program. After we hear from each of our panelists, we will open the discussion to questions from the audience. To ask a question, you can simply type the question into the question box on the right-hand side of the screen at any time during the webinar. We'll take as many questions as possible within the time at following each uh, speaker's presentation. Our first speaker, Mark Robin, is an officer at the Pew Charitable Trust and co-author of the report, serving as the focus of today's program. Our second presenter will be Arkansas Representative Grant Hodges, who is serving his second term in the Arkansas House of Representatives. Representative Hodges chairs the K-12 Vocational Technical Institution Subcommittee of the House Education Committee. Our third panelist will be Hawaii Representative Angus McKelvey, who has served the 10th House District since 2006. Representative McKelvey currently chairs the House Higher Education Committee. We look forward to hearing from all of our distinguished speakers and thank all of them for agreeing to participate in today's session. Now I'll turn the program over to Mark Robin. Thank you, Dustin. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today as we discuss federal and state support for higher education through the tax code. This conversation is happening at a time when people have been paying an unusual amount of attention to taxes, both because tax day was just a couple weeks ago and because there's been a lot of discussion here in D.C. about the potential for major tax reform. But as you know, uh, beyond collecting revenue, policymakers across all levels of government also use the tax code as a tool to achieve policy goals. So it's critical to think about how tax programs fit alongside spending programs that have similar purposes. Higher education is a prime example of this. Tax benefits play a substantive role in federal and state support for students, but they often don't get considered alongside spending programs. 
the goal of the research I'll be presenting here today was to shine a light on these tax provisions and place them in context to help integrate them into broader policy debates. Uh, this discussion is based, uh, as Dustin said, on a report that we released back in February that provides a comprehensive overview of federal and state higher ed tax provisions. So a quick outline here, I'll first briefly provide a high-level perspective on federal and state spending. Then I'll talk about how most state higher ed tax benefits arise from the way that states piggyback on federal tax law. And then I'll wrap up with a discussion of the cost of these tax benefits. So what is the overall landscape of federal and state spending? Uh, this slide shows the different categories of federal and state support for higher education. You can see that each level of government spent over $70 billion on higher education related programs in 2014. Now please note that we are excluding loans from this picture because loans are paid back with interest. Uh, federal spending largely breaks out into three major categories. The biggest is the Pell Grant program, which provides need-based financial aid, mostly to students from low-income families. The next largest category is funding for specific research projects. And then third is funding for veterans' educational benefits. Now, what's clear from these three categories is that the vast majority of federal higher education dollars directly support students and research projects at a wide range of public and private institutions. State dollars for higher education break down a little differently. The large majority of state higher ed funding provides general support for public colleges and universities, with smaller but still substantial amounts spent on financial aid for individual students and on research. So how do income tax benefits fit into this picture? At the federal level, if we added in a category for tax benefits that support students and families, it would be the single largest category at around $35 billion, or 14% more than Pell Grant. But at the state level, we don't have a complete picture. Most states don't have full cost estimates for the tax benefits they provide. Now, I'll come back to this point a little bit later after we talk about um, how these tax benefits are structured. But before I get there, I need to give you some more background on federal and state tax expenditures. Note that I'll be focusing today on personal income tax provisions that are targeted at students and their families to help uh, offset the cost of attending college. So for example, we won't be covering tax expenditures that benefit institutions, such as the tax advantages of nonprofit status for universities. One big takeaway from our research is that most state tax expenditures for higher education arise because states piggyback on federal tax law. So I'll start with some of the federal provisions first, and then I'll move on to the state level. We found it useful to think of tax provisions as targeting three different phases of paying for higher education. The phrase, those phases are saving for college, paying for college while enrolled, and paying off student loans. This slide shows the major federal tax expenditures and how they fit into these categories. I won't cover all of these in detail, but as you can see, most federal tax expenditures fall into the second phase, paying for costs while enrolled, while just a couple of the tax expenditures fall into the other categories. As I mentioned, many states piggyback on federal tax law. Most states start their tax calculations with a federal income measure. Now, to understand why this is important, we have to understand that many of these federal tax expenditures are come in the form of exclusions and deductions. And I'll explain what those concepts mean. Uh, exclusions are types of income that are not taxed. So, for example, scholarship income is excluded from taxable income in most cases. Another major exclusion is income earned in saving and investment accounts, known as qualified tuition programs, often referred to as 529 plans after the relevant section of the tax code. Now, as long as they're used to pay for higher education expenses, investment earnings in 529s can grow and be withdrawn tax-free. And this tax exclusion is intended to encourage and help families save for college. Deductions, on the other hand, are expenses that can be subtracted from income. Examples of deductions would be the deduction for interest paid on student loans, and the deduction for tuition expenses. Both deductions and exclusions reduce the federal measure of income known as adjusted gross income. This slide illustrates this point. Now I know it's a bit complicated, but what I want to focus on here is just a couple main points. You can see that deductions and exclusions are subtracted here, which means that they reduce federal adjusted gross income and the closely related amount known as taxable income. 
tax rates are then applied to taxable income yielding an initial tax liability. And then finally, tax credits are subtracted from this initial liability to arrive at your final taxes owed. Now the key point here is that many states begin their tax calculations with this federal income amount that already has these higher ed exclusions and deductions baked into it. In fact, most state higher ed tax provisions come from linkages to federal income. As you can see from this table, of the 41 states and DC with a personal income tax, nearly all of them allow the federal exclusions and deductions. For example, all 41 states and the district follow the federal government in allowing earnings in 529 plans to grow and be withdrawn tax-free. And 37 states plus DC allow the student loan interest deduction. However, in some cases, even states that start with federal income will go back and disallow a federal provision. An example of this is the tuition and fees deduction. Even though it's incorporated into federal adjusted gross income, fewer states are linked to it in this table because several of them go back and add this amount back into state income, effectively disallowing the, the deduction. Another interesting case is the personal exemption, which allows a fixed dollar amount to be uh, deducted from income for each member of the household. 38 states and DC follow the federal government in allowing a personal exemption for children through age 23 which is above the normal age cap of 18, provided those children are in school full time. Uh, now notably, with a few exceptions, states typically are not linked to federal credits. The single largest federal higher ed tax provision is the American Opportunity Tax Credit, which cost around $20 billion in 2014 and provides up to $2,500 per student annually to help cover undergraduate tuition. One of, uh, one of the few states that does link to this credit is Kentucky, which offers a version of the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Now, while many state uh, tax provisions stem from linkages to the federal tax code, states also provide some higher ed tax benefits that are independent of federal law. The most common example relates to the 529 savings plans. In addition to the tax exemption for uh, investment earnings in these accounts, 33 states and DC offer a credit or deduction for contributions to 529s. These deductions typically have caps which vary across the states, but in a few cases they are unlimited. There are also more unique provisions that states offer separately from federal law, sometimes with significant costs. New York, for example, offers a choice between a deduction and a credit for tuition, which resulted in a cumulative revenue loss of $240 million in 2013. To put this in perspective, earlier this year, Governor Cuomo of New York released a much publicized plan to provide free tuition to many students at public schools in the state, and this is estimated to cost $163 million per year. As I noted earlier, higher education tax provisions at the federal level totaled about $35 billion. But our research has shown that many states have less information on how much higher ed tax benefits cost them. Only a handful of states produce comprehensive cost estimates of their higher ed tax provisions. Specifically, of the 41 states in DC with an income tax, we found that only nine in DC had cost estimates available for at least two thirds of the relevant tax provisions. This means that many states don't know how much they're spending through the tax code on higher ed benefits. Still, the information we were able to collect shows that the costs can be significant. This slide shows the total cost of higher education tax expenditures in those nine states in DC with fairly comprehensive estimates and how those costs compare to financial aid spending. The key takeaway here is that in most of these states, tax expenditures are a substantial part of the portion they direct to students, uh, a, a substantial portion of the support they direct to students and families. As you can see in the last column, in DC and eight of the nine states, the value of tax expenditures was comparable to more than 25% of what the state spent on financial aid grants. Now, as I noted earlier, state financial aid only makes up about 13% of total state higher ed spending, but we use financial aid here as a benchmark because it's the type of spending most similar to the tax expenditures we're talking about. That is, it's spending that's targeted to students and families rather than, say, universities, and in many cases can be used in a wide range of public and private schools. But the key point here is that many states don't have comprehensive cost estimates for their higher ed tax provisions, but the, where the data is available, it shows that those costs can be substantial when compared to similar spending programs. 
Finally, as you consider these provisions, it's important to remember that there are various reasons states choose to conform to federal tax law. It may increase simplicity for tax filers because they can simply copy numbers over from their federal forms. Uh, this in turn may help reduce errors and increase compliance. By conforming closely to federal law, states also benefit from IRS administration and enforcement. And of course, state policymakers may, may conform uh, in order to reinforce policy goals they share with the federal government. But conforming also means that federal changes can impact state tax policies. If a state did not want to follow a federal change, they may be able to decouple, but that could present challenges, for example, if federal legislation doesn't line up with state legislative sessions. And of course, you may have to give up some of the benefits of conformity, such as simplicity for tax filers. So in summary, our findings show that state higher education tax expenditures largely stem from the use of federal tax law. Uh, the data suggests that their costs can be significant in some cases, but at the same time, many states are not fully aware of the cost because they don't have complete estimates. So now I'll pass it off to Representative Hodges from Arkansas to tell us about uh, his experience. Thank you, uh, Mark. I appreciate that. Can everyone hear me? Yep, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I first want to thank uh, NCSL and Pew for uh, their really terrific work on this. Uh, it's just I've really enjoyed reading uh, your reports and, and the work you've done. I want to thank NCSL for allowing me to participate in this discussion. And uh, lastly, I want to personally thank Dustin Whedon because uh, I contacted him before I filed my bill, and he was very helpful. Uh, my bill that I filed this session uh, in Arkansas was for an income tax credit for educational loan payments. And uh, unfortunately, I, I wasn't able to get it passed into law this session, but I'm hoping to continue to work on it and hopefully bring it up again uh, in my next session. Uh, first off, I'll say that I uh, am turning 27 next week, so uh, I have a, a more recent college experience than most of my colleagues in the uh, legislature and I think that gives me a, a bit of a different perspective and probably makes me more aware and sensitive uh, to issues uh, that we're discussing here today. Uh, I, I was a beneficiary of, of the Pell Grant and the American Opportunity Tax Credit as a college student and uh, still use the student loan interest deduction myself so these issues are, are very real to me personally and uh, important for a lot of people uh, like me, a lot of students and, and recent graduates who uh, have student debt. Um, just to give you a little overview of the landscape in Arkansas, we do have a, a 529 program that our state treasurer does a lot of PR for. Unfortunately, I think our utilization still is pretty low, uh, which a lot of states, I think, experience. We're trying to get more people to take advantage of that program. Uh, we have about a $5.5 billion state budget, and we give direct uh, higher education support of about $735 million to our colleges and universities, so about 13% of our state budget goes to higher ed. And uh, just for some perspective, it was 18% 30 years ago. So uh, unfortunately, we've seen a, a trend in the state, and I think nationally, of less support going uh, to higher education. I think that's driven a lot of the increase in intuition and college uh, loan debt. Um, in the state, we do have one tax credit uh, for tuition reimbursement. That was passed in 1999 in Arkansas, and it provides a tax credit for companies to reimburse full-time employees for tuition, books, and fees. Uh, that credit can be 30%. Um, it reimburses 30% of those costs but it can't exceed more than 25% of that business tax liability. Uh, I think since 1999, I've, I've requested the records, and I believe uh, less than $2 million in credits has been used. So I don't think that program is very well known. I know I brought it up to the state chamber, and not many people seem to know it existed. So we probably need to be doing more marketing on that as well, because uh, I think more employers should be taking advantage of that and helping their employees uh, pursue higher education if they would like and to get a tax credit to do that. Uh, part of the reason I filed my bill was because, uh, you know, I think we do a lot on the front end, both on the federal level and on the state level. On the front end, trying to help students with uh, their college education costs. 
for example, in Arkansas, uh, there are three main ways, at least that, that I'm familiar with. One is the Governor's Distinguished Scholarship, and that uh, is a limited number of scholarships. I think it's a few hundred, and that, that covers up to $10,000 per year for tuition. And we have a lottery scholarship as well in Arkansas uh, for our state lottery program. And uh, that's kind of a tiered system where I think you get $1,000 your first year for college. And then a, as an incentive to stay in college, I think it goes up to 2000 your sophomore year and then 4000 your junior year, 5000 your senior year. Those numbers probably aren't exactly right, but uh, that's the general idea. And then, uh, of course, the direct support that we provide through the state budget to our higher ed institutions. Uh, like I said, that's about 13% of our state budget. Uh, now, even though we do that on the front end for uh, our students, we're still graduating students uh, with a lot of uh, student loan debt, uh, like, like I'm sure a lot of states are. Uh, I would, for our four-year college graduates, on average, you know, a lot of them are coming out with $25,000 of debt. That's probably about average. Uh, so it's, it's a huge problem, and, and that's uh, a lot of the reason I decided to file my legislation, because uh, I support the programs that we have and the, and the financial support we provide to students as they're going into college and the 529 program to plan ahead for college. But I didn't really see that we were doing a lot of stuff, you know, after students had graduated uh, as a state. And so that's why I filed my bill. It was modeled after uh, the state of Maine's program, which they call Opportunity Maine. Uh, I just had come across it and, and found it really interesting. And so, uh, you know, the idea is that college graduates who are employed full-time in the state could get a tax credit on the payments that they make towards their student loans. I think in Maine, that comes out to uh, $4,500 per year that they can get in, um, in uh, tax credits for paying on their student loans. Uh, as I saw it, there were three main benefits. And these were uh, similar to what I had in my discussions with Maine legislators and with uh, Mr. Whedon and, and other folks that I spoke with about this. Uh, one being that we would want to recruit more college graduates to live and work in our state. Uh, we're 49th or 50th in the country in terms of our percent of our population uh, with a college degree. So the more college graduates we can get to come to Arkansas, the better. Uh, secondly, it could give our employers a competitive advantage when recruiting potential employees. Uh, you know, if we were one of the only few states that offered this program, people know that if they come to Arkansas, they can get help paying off their student loans. I think that would really give our employers here in the state an advantage in trying to uh, recruit talent for their for their companies. Uh, and then, and then, lastly, uh, I th I saw that it could be a good tool to help relieve our young people of the burden of their student loans. Um, this would, uh, you know, allow them to make other big purchases that they're currently being forced to put off, uh, like buying a home or a car. A lot of you have probably been reading in the last few years that uh, millennials are being forced to wait longer than uh, previous generations and starting families, buying homes, buying cars, making other big purchases because they're saddled with, uh, you know, very large amounts of student uh, loan debt. And so, uh, you know, hopefully from an economic standpoint, uh, if we could help them uh, with their student loans through a tax credit program, we could sort of uh, boost the economy by allowing them to spend money on other, on other products. Um, with my bill, we did hit a snag in that uh, our fiscal impact came back uh, pretty astronomical. Uh, and I, I didn't have a lot of time to work through the bill and find out why they came up with the numbers they did. In discussing the program in Maine, they had told me it cost somewhere between 13 and 18 million dollars per year uh, for their program, and, and our uh, estimates came back at 91 million the first year, and uh, it kind of ballooned up to 455 million uh, after five years. And so, uh, I don't know where we crossed wires on that. I think um, if I could work on the bill a little bit, I, I think we'd get it more in line with uh, what Maine is spending. Uh, you know, more in that 13 to 18 million dollar range, and uh, you know, speaking to that, the last thing I'll say is that there's a lot of different variations you can do uh, with a tax credit program like this. Uh, I, you know, Maine has a lot of different um, rules and, and different programs. As far as it, is it a two-year degree or a four-year degree and a, a STEM degree, 
And so you could you could make this program work however uh, you think is best for you. You could make it to where uh, you could only get the tax credit if you um, were making payments on a STEM degree, uh, or if uh, you know the the uh, beneficiary, the person using the credit had graduated from a college or university in your state. Initially in Maine, uh, I think that it was only if you had graduated from a Maine college that you could get the tax credit, but I think they expanded it to where it could be any uh, any college or university across the country. As long as you were working full-time in the state of Maine, you could get the credit. Uh, so you could do it either way. And then lastly, I'd considered just making it a program for state employees. Uh, I know on the federal level, a lot of uh, departments and agencies, uh, if you work for them, then they uh, help pay off your student loans, and that's really a strong incentive uh, in terms of recruiting people to work for uh, the federal government, and uh, I think helps them retain quality people, even if salaries aren't as high as we might like them to be. So I've seen that be a, a pretty big success on the federal level, and so you know, if if I come back and we can't afford to do this uh, on a, on a you know expansive scale, then I think one of the ways we could possibly save on the cost of a tax credit program would be to allow it for state employees as an extra benefit uh, to try to uh, get good people working for our state government. So uh, happy to take questions about it. Like I said, uh, I'm going to have to do some work on it and, and come up with some solutions to get our, uh, you know, the cost of the program down. But I'm still really excited about it. I, I got a lot of positive feedback from uh, young people, from college students, and uh, I think it could be a really great program for us. So. Hopefully, going forward, uh, we can make some good changes, and maybe uh, in less than two years when we have our next general session, I'll get another crack at it. But uh, with that, thank you all again for, for having me, and uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know here on the webinar. If you want to contact me personally, um, you know my, my email is uh, repgranthodges at gmail.com. If you have any questions, happy to work with you. And uh, with that, I'll pass it on uh, to our other representative, Mr. McKelvey from Hawaii. Thank you all. Hello. Hello, aloha, everybody. Can, I hope you can hear me on their end. Um, I'm going to assume that you can. Uh, I'm Representative Angus McKelvey, and I have just actually, um, it's funny, quite a difference from Representative Hodges in so far as the Representative Hodges, you know, I, Although much younger than me bi uh, biographically, um, is much more experienced. I just took over the chairmanship of this committee about 10 days ago. But the work that we've been doing in higher ed goes far beyond that. And some of the things that we've been doing in Hawaii is a very unique animal. And so far as we don't follow a lot of what the states do, we don't have a 529, and we don't allow the, the personal deductions that other states do for higher education costs. Uh, in our in Hawaii, the most tax policy bills that relate to higher education flow through the subject matter committee, the higher education committee first. And as such, they it is instrumentally done at that level, whereas the money committees would look at it from a fiscal impact. You know, can it be afforded? Are there going to be what is the total cost out over the years versus the benefits? And we'll have worked with the overall state budget and the other budgetary constraints that are coming down for other areas. Uh, some This year was a unique new year for lawmakers in that many of the back-end things that are being done for education haven't been considered. It was mostly front-end in the state of Hawaii, where through scholarships and direct spending for research and other types of things, that higher education is supported. Um, this, however, because of the, the election this year and because of the overwhelming vociferous outpouring from the public, from all sectors on the high cost of higher education and student debt, men, myself and many lawmakers introduced several measures to try to allow for deductions that are not in the tax code for higher education as well as other programs to, for loan repayment. Three of note were House Bill 1276, which was a, for student loan interest deduction. Uh, the other one, House Bill 916, which was for our rural health care provider loan repayment. And then the final one, House Bill 373, which targeted all students whose parents have not earned a degree yet themselves. Um, these bills here, the House Bill 1276 died earlier this session, as we say in the business over here. House Bill 373 
also did not make it. And a lot of it had to do with the concerns of delimiting it to those parents who had not yet get a degree and how that would be applied and what was meant by legally by degree and what would be qualifying. The bill that did make it, it was just reported at a conference two days ago, was House Bill 916, which is a rural health care provider loan repayment. Uh, this measure here would allow for those who go into service in certain medical fields in rural areas, especially in Hawaii where there's a serious shortage of physicians, to be able to pay back their loans by making this type of commitment. Uh, over here, we try to target these types of benefits to the pressing needs that are occurring in our areas, like in the professional side. Shortage of the physicians, nurses, and psychologists are one of those areas, which is why House Bill 916, I think, was successful, and we were able to find room for it in the budget. Uh, the, this program here is going to also have a big impact in that it will help to go ahead and to ensure that we can somehow attract more people into this area and willing to serve in Hawaii in these underserved areas after their career. Uh, another program that we did on the front end um, this year was the Promise Program. And this was a scholarship program that was not a loan, as was mentioned before, but it's a scholarship program that was directed towards those who kids who are willing to commit to staying in the state of Hawaii to do the university here after they've exhausted all of the means of financing for their college education. The measure itself did not make it. It failed. However, $1.8 million was set aside in the state budget, which closed on Monday, to provide for the Promise Program um, scholarships. One of the challenging things in Hawaii that other states may not have, or policymakers, is that we have an autonomy provision in our state constitution that dictates that the legislature shall pass no laws impacting the university programs or policies unless they're laws of statewide general applicability. Because of that, many of the, of the initiatives that other states have considered have to be approached a little bit differently as to not to run afoul of the constitutional provision. Uh, however, the Promise Program, although the measure didn't pass, because of the autonomy provision, the Board of Regents, which is our governing entity over here, is going to be able to implement this program through parameters that they've set up similar to the bill. But where the constant conversation or tension occurs is how do policymakers ensure that the oversight that they want on and provisions in this measure actually translate forward to the Promise Program as enacted by the university. And so this is one that we'll probably come back and revisit because it's very, you know, we want to ensure that the resources for the program are being distributed in the areas that we're, and the parameters for this program are being applied to as envisioned by the legislature, both at the community college and at the higher education system level. One of the things Hawaii does do to assist on the scholarship front end in the past is we've often created targeted scholarships for disadvantaged groups, particularly minorities, and for our indigenous native Hawaiian population, which is often the group um, that has had the least access to higher education, has, has the most uh, problems in being able to afford the cost of higher education in Hawaii, even though they are in-state residents. Um, there's also been tuition uh, waivers given as well as tuition exemptions for certain groups like veterans who are coming back to Hawaii. Um, this, of course, creates strain insofar as that other revenue is needed to supplant the operations of the university and with the mind being the tuition costs themselves to bear that solely on the backs of tuition could create another problem of access to higher education. Um, you know, one of the things that higher ed tax provisions fitting in the overall picture of higher ed funding, you know, the, the policy goals that we've tried to do this year is to say how can we look at programs like Maine and others that use tax credits and the tax code to go ahead and provide this type of relief. Unfortunately, many of these measures failed this year because of the overall budget issues occurring on other fronts. Um, everything comes out of our general revenue fund here, and these competing things, along with collective bargaining, uh, have put a great strain and limited the ability to enact several of these programs. I'm excited to hear about the work that the good representative of Arkansas is doing, and as somebody who's coming into this new, uh, I will 
hope to work with him and NCSL over the interim to perhaps bringing a version of Maine's tax credit program here. And of course, you know, to look at the ability of being able to do the loan repayment through the, for state employees, although we'll have to work that might be a collective bargaining issue, I do not know. But at this point, these ideas are ideas I think that could, are very well worth exploring over here in Hawaii. And that could really be a value to our citizenry, especially in the area, you know, in trying to get this critical higher education we need. Our, one of the challenges we have here in Hawaii, in which we try to weave into these programs, is what we call brain drain. Many of our students, when they complete their education, because of such high student debt, are forced to go to the mainland, leave Hawaii, and take higher paying jobs and opportunities elsewhere which of course hurts our overall economic growth and our diversity. So the Promise Program and some of these others, work has been made that how do we create incentives or mechanisms to bring the students back or to have them stay in Hawaii. And I think that's the reason why House Bill 916 went ahead and passed in so far this year and 1276 and 373 and other measures like it did not go ahead and move forward is because you the loan rural health care provider loan repayment has a mechanism to guide to make sure these professionals are going back into the communities in Hawaii where it's needed and thereby grow our economy and create that the next generation that we need so desperately of skilled professionals across all sectors especially in this area right here uh, so these are the many things that we've been doing this year. Um, again, the, the, the autonomy and, of course, the ability of the Higher Education Committee to guide these types of discussions and where the, having the tax committee playing a back-end role, so to speak, unlike other states where the ta it sounds like these money committees are the driving entities in tax policy and how it affects higher education. Our numbers about the impacts on higher education insofar as tax spending goes is incomplete, as was noted earlier. I think, too, we are much more restrictive than other states in not allowing personal deductions uh, and also not allowing 529 uh, programs. However, and of course, we are one of the few states that doesn't really have a robust effort either through tax credits or other types of mechanisms in the tax codes to give people the ability to, to afford higher education. And these are the types of things that we work through, but a lot of it revolves around the fact that traditionally everything has been done through scholarships and directed spending and other mechanisms. And only now, finally, is the legislature, and I'm hoping this conversation will continue, is looking at these other efforts other states have done, and in particular, as was mentioned earlier, what Maine and some of these other things for people have done to try to use tax credits and other provisions to help fund higher education for our students. So with that, I thank NCSL for allowing me to speak on this and any questions uh, on this or our bills or how we are different or uh, would be great. And of course, you can also email me at repmckelvey at capital, C-A-P-I-T-O-L dot Hawaii dot gov um, for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative McKelvey. Um, we are now ready to take your questions. You can submit a question by clicking on the control panel on the right side of your screen. Once you do so, just enter your query in the questions box. Uh, we have a couple of questions that have already come in. Um, first for uh, Mark Robin at Pew. The question is, there was a lot of variation in the table comparing tax expenditures to financial aid in each state. Uh, could you talk about what's going on there? Yeah, that's a very good question. So our uh, research didn't really explore all the drivers of this variation. Um, but that would be a really good question for policymakers to explore. Um, I think it would really be dependent on each state about you know the population and the types of tax policies they have. Um, one thing, a couple things I would note is that uh, there's at least potentially two things going on here. First is that tax policy varies across states. So some states have more federal tax provisions or allow more federal tax provisions to flow through. And then some states have their own specific, um, you know, provisions separate from federal law. Uh, and that's one side of the comparison. The other side of the comparison, though, is the financial aid, and that also varies by state. So there could be a number of reasons why that comparison would be um, uh, so different across states. But it's 
a really important thing for policymakers to think about and look into um, when they're thinking about you know how they want to support students and families uh, in higher education. And a uh, second question also for Mark, uh, where did you get the cost estimates from that you talked about and why don't a lot of states have estimates? Yeah, another, that's another good question. So we used uh, states' own tax expenditure reports to collect this information. Uh, most uh, revenue departments uh, produce a tax expenditure report. Uh, in a few cases, we received some information directly from uh, researchers at the revenue departments, uh, but mostly it was from tax expenditure reports. Um, those tax expenditure reports are usually required by law in most states, but not in all states. Um, and it's also important to know that even when they are required by law, um, some tax expenditure reports don't include every tax provision. So, for example, some reports don't include provisions that states um, get by piggybacking off the federal tax code. So that's one reason why even if a state has a tax expenditure report, it may not have full coverage of the provisions we were looking at, although it may include many other provisions. But, that, but I would also add that that is one reason um, that policymakers should be thinking about what the costs are, because in some cases they don't know what those costs are. Thanks. Um, and the next question is, is for either representative. Um, is there an advantage to targeting your benefits timing-wise to pre-college, college enrollment, or post-college? Representative Hodges, Michael. Yep. No, go ahead, Representative. Yeah. Um, initially, I, I can't think of um, an advantage of one over the other. I, I guess the only thing that comes to mind is that um, when we're dealing with the back end, as we've been describing it, once uh, students have already accumulated debt, then of course they're going to be starting to pay interest on that. Uh, whereas if you could, you know, um, try to get their uh, student uh, costs. On the front end, they wouldn't have to deal with that. So, you know, as much as we can get students into college and with scholarships and uh, and assistance like that, um, you know, of course, the less money that they're graduating with and paying interest on, the better. But um, I think, you know, we all can see that realistically, uh, a lot of our students are going to be graduating with pretty significant debt, at least for the foreseeable future. So. I think for the time being, it at least makes sense to start thinking about some ways that we can help them uh, on the back end and paying off some of these uh, loans. Yeah, I mean, the, the same with the uh, good representative from Arkansas. I think uh, on our side, it's also because we're out here in a very isolated state, it also it revolves around trying to create a pipeline for incentivizing the uh, students to stay within the University of Hawaii system here in Hawaii. Right now, I, we face a similar issue in Arkansas. Um, you know, a lot of our uh, students that graduate from Arkansas colleges end up going to Dallas or Kansas City or, uh, you know, cities uh, around our area. But, you know, from the area I represent in northwest Arkansas, uh, we do pretty well. Uh, we have, you know, the headquarters of Walmart and Tyson and J.B. Hunt and the University of Arkansas, but uh, the rest of the state. Uh, isn't as fortunate with uh, some of their, you know, employment prospects. So we have a similar problem, not as extreme as uh, Hawaii, obviously, with y'all being um, not contiguous to the U.S. But uh, that's definitely another consideration uh, when we're looking at, um, you know, trying to get students to get their education here in Arkansas and hopefully stay and have their families and um, and work in the state as well after they complete their education. All right, one additional question for, um, for both representatives. Um, what advice would you have for a colleague uh, seeking to introduce a piece of legislation like this? Go ahead, sir. I'll let Arkansas go first. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, I think my first piece of advice, you could probably tell um, here for me and, and Representative McKelvey that 
uh, really when it came down to the, the numbers, it came down to the dollars. And uh, so I think the, the most important thing is to try to get an idea of what your legislation would cost. And like I said towards the end of uh, my, my part of the discussion, uh, you know, try to uh, uh, get some changes made to your bill or, or get your legislation crafted in a way that it's, it's realistic and, and could have a chance of surviving uh, your budget negotiations. Um, you know, when we spend $735 million uh, for higher ed in the state of Arkansas, a $455 million tax credit program uh, wasn't going to go anywhere. And so when I approach it next time, I'm going to, you know, do my best to make sure that it's, it's within a reasonable um, amount of money. And uh, I think that's probably the most important thing. But definitely, you know, I think the work that Pew and NCSL have been doing about trying to get an idea of what your state does in terms of uh, money, but also uh, through the tax code, you know, that's something that I'm not sure that I've seen uh, as a member of the legislature from my state. So to have that sort of resource, I think, would have been very helpful to know what sort of uh, tax provisions we have currently. Uh, I, I have a general idea, but I'm sure uh, that there's a lot of stuff out there um, that I've missed. I know we have a, a similar program that Representative McKelvey spoke about with the rural physicians because uh, we also have that same problem trying to get, uh, uh, you know, physicians into the more rural parts of our state. And we do have that program. And there's a lot of things out there that uh, it's hard to get them all in one place. So I think, uh, you know, the, the general idea of the discussion we're having to try to get all of that information uh, would be really helpful before you begin working on uh, your own legislation, just to have the full picture. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with the representative from uh, Arkansas. He uh, hits the nail on the head. And I think the other thing, too, is on our end is, you know, to to look at the cost-benefit analysis. You know, this is an argument that gets made across many different areas of policy in the legislature. It's not just the revenue loss per se, but what is the benefit being gained, and is that benefit through a multiplier or other thing going to be exponentially, you know, offset any direct revenue loss? And finally, uh, you know, really getting out to the stakeholders, the you know, the university itself, the students, and others to get them engaged, and to hopefully help make those compelling arguments to whatever money committee, you know, so they can look beyond but just the dollars and cents and look at it as an investment and that the cost benefit, the benefits that are higher than the cost may be up front. But the data that Pew has gotten um, and NCSL is working on is really critical and I know that, you know, it will help to bolster the efforts to move these things beyond, you know, the money committees and hopefully upstairs to the respective governors of whoever, whichever uh, legislature members listening, you know, are working for. Thank you both so much. Uh, seeing no additional questions, I will turn it back over to Dustin. Well, thank you everyone for your participation today and thank you to all three of our excellent panelists. We appreciate all your comments and guidance and knowledge on this topic. Uh, just a reminder that this webinar was being recorded and will be available and archived on the NCSL website. And we have now reached the conclusion of our webinar. If you have any questions about uh, this event or any of the topics that were covered, please contact uh, me, Dustin Whedon at NCSL, or Phil Olaf or Mark Robin at Pew for additional information. And our contact information was briefly mentioned on the screen, so definitely check out the uh, archived webinar. And as a reminder, the information I highlighted today will be available on the NCSL website and the Pew website. And we thank you very much for your interest and in particip in participation in today's webinar. Thank you so much, and look forward to meeting you soon, uh, Representative Hodges. <laughs> Likewise. Thank you all.